It's very nice to be described as a Jewish dog walker rather than as a community rabbi. Um, and I'm usually known as the rabbi with the dog. I thought it would be in bad taste to bring the animals to Green to Greenbelt because um, they're not allowed at Limud, the Jewish equivalent, so I didn't see why they should have entrance tickets here. Um, but I do love animals, and I do find nature an abode of God, as I think we would, we would, uh, we would share the beginning of Psalm 24, La Donai Haaretz Umeloah, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Um, perhaps I should just try this one on a lighter note out. I've never tried this with a, a non-Jewish audience before, but when I told my own teacher, who's no longer alive, that I had a dog, he said, um, you know the story about the congregant who used to ask his rabbi whether every detail of food was kosher? And everybody else in the congregation began to ask this question. Is it kosher? Is it not kosher? It's a classic question you ask a rabbi of, you know, can I eat this? Can I not these? But there was one member of that community who never asked any questions. So the rabbi said, don't you have any doubts about what you're allowed to eat? The man answered, no. The Torah says, if it's treif, not kosher, throw it to the dog and the dog will eat it. It is indeed a verse in the Torah. So if I'm not sure, I put it in front of the dog. <laughs> if the dog eats it, it's proof that it wasn't kosher. <laughs> so after a year or so, the man begins to ask questions about, the, about kashrut and what he can eat of the rabbi. So the rabbi's taken aback and he says, ah, nebuch, sadly, has your dog died? The man says, no, he's just become very strict. <laughs> so, in, in the Jewish mystical tradition, there are two modes of revelation. I think the most familiar and the one, at least on the overt level, we, we most completely share as Jews and Christians is the sense of God's, God's commandments with their essence as the as the Ten Commandments, the Aseret Hadibrot, beginning, I am the Lord your God. But in the mystical tradition, which um, has its origins again in the classic rabbinic period in the time of Jesus and, there and immediately after, there is also a second tradition, not of the Ten Commandments, but of the Ten Divine Sayings. The Ten Times that it says, Vayome Elohim, God said in the account of creation, with which the Hebrew Bible opens. There's one problem with this. Count them, and there are nine. But this never deterred the rabbis who said, well, the very word in the beginning is itself an utterance. And this has been at the root of the mystical tradition and of the theology of the Zohar, the Book of Splendor, which has understood 10 manifestations of the divine light as imminent and present in all things. It's a tradition that I love and that comes to come its culmination in some ways in the teaching of Hasidic thought. Hasidic thought being the Jewish mystical tradition that was brought most fully alive in Poland and Eastern Europe in the 18th century and that is thriving now. And in the words of its founder, the Baal Shem Tov, late atar panui mine, there is no space empty of God. You spoke, Rachel, beautifully about green spaces. I'm a keen gardener and a very keen walker. I sometimes say my prayers while walking. Sometimes even, I know I shouldn't do this, sort of from a legal point of view, while running with my dog very late at night, at midnight. And the sense of, I was going to say God's presence, but once you use God is just in the way it's a syllable. I'm also interested in the fact that you invert the letters and you get the word dog. I, it's very kind of um, <laughs> blasphemous. Um, it's just a sound or a syllable. And the question becomes then, what do I mean by it? And something of what I mean by it is the, the sense of the consciousness and the one life that, in words with words, rolls through all things, that is present in all of nature, that is there in every human heart. There is no discrimination in this, in every human heart of every age. I sometimes occasionally have put my prayer shawl over the dog's head when I can't concentrate and felt, well, we're one life and we're together. 
and his life and my life make me feel part of a greater life, and that's how I find whatever it is that I call God. This concern with the presence of God in nature also has and needs to have practical consequences. When there was the huge gathering of in Paris in November, December, I think the church led with the Bishop of Salisbury. To my great regret, whereas Jews have been very strong on refugee issues, the Jews of this country have been very weak on environmental issues, and there was relatively little presence. But um, if, if God is there in all nature, all of life is sacred, and the notion that one can destroy any of it has to be wrong. That's what makes me a passionate vegetarian and a patron of the Jewish Vegetarian Society. It's also what makes one of my favorite verses in the whole of the Hebrew Bible, and it's a verse we very much share in Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 11. The words, Lo yareu yashritu, they shall not hurt nor shall they destroy in all my holy mountain. And in a way, it's my life's ideal, not to hurt and not to destroy. And for those reasons, I've been very involved in learning from Eco Church, which is an Arocha, really originally a Catholic project, and which has created this marvelous scheme for churches to assess their environmental impact and their impact on congregants' lives in sophisticated ways. And I'm in debate with them about creating eco synagogue and eco community where synagogues and mosques and schools and churches all have to work together to change our attitude to the earth. And it's not just for scientific reasons. To me, it's a profoundly sacred mission to honor God's earth in all species. I was once preparing for conducting a funeral, and I often take the dog with me, have a short walk with him as I think through what I'm going to say, and a short walk afterwards to just ponder the sorrows. And as we walked, there was the sound of shooting, and I watched birds simply fall out of the sky. Well, there are reasons why people would hunt if they have nothing to eat, and in fact, in a famous respo rabbinic responsum on whether or not it's allowed to hunt in Jewish tradition, the only concession made is if you are starving and have no other way to feed yourself, because anyway, such food would not be kosher. But I was shocked, not as shocked as the dog who bolted back to the car and would never leave it in the same place again, but shocked at the notion that it's okay to kill that something is flying and beautiful, and now it's dead, and one is proud of the fact. And that can be extended as a metaphor to the whole of life. So maybe I'll conclude close to where I began with a sense of the mystical tradition which sees, God, sees God's utterances as present in all life, and no place void of the divine presence. The successor to the founder of Hasidism, the Baal, the Baal Shem Tov was the founder. His successor was Rev Dov, Rabbi Dov Baer of the small Polish town of Mezerich. And he made an observation on words which had come in the Jewish everyday morning service. The words are very simple. Mala ha'aretz kinyanecha. The earth is full of what is yours. They're based, those words, on the same Psalm 24. The earth in its fullness belong to the Lord. But he said, don't understand the Hebrew words as what is yours. Understand them slightly differently. They loved plays and creative misinterpretations, the Hasidic, the Hasidic teachers and speakers. He said, understand it as the earth is full of ways of acquiring and finding you, God. And I find my God in people, and I find my God in trees, and I find my God in the birds, and I find my God in walking my dog. Thank you. <laughs>